hello and welcome everyone to the 12th um, WEMCAST Academy live event. So this session is going to be on pre hospital careers. Uh, we're going to be exploring in this session how you can break into the incredibly rewarding world of pre hospital medicine by hearing from our panellists and specialists. So my name is Wayne Walker, I'm WEM Trauma Lead and Critical Care Paramedic. Uh, today I'm joined by firstly Claire Fitchett. Welcome Claire. Thank you. Uh, Claire is critical care paramedic at Thames Valley Air Ambulance, uh, undertaking an MSc in advanced clinical practice uh, at the moment. Claire believes that in, uh, continued ed education and learning is the key to being the best person you can be. So Claire is a keen explorer, has undertaken various expeditions within the British Exploring Society. Um, and some of her highlights um, uh, regarding this were in the Peruvian jungle in 2018 and most recently in 2019 as a medic on a collaborative joint sea and land expedition with the Jubilee Sailing Trust to Iceland. Um, having completed her first expedition at the age of 16 with the Air Training Corps, she particularly, she's got a particular passion for helping young people realise their potential. Okay. So our second panellist is Ollie Nice. Welcome, Ollie. Hello. Ollie um, has spent over 12 years as a helicopter loadmaster within the Royal Air Force. So in his aviation career is absolutely vast and varied. So he's operated many different helicopters in various roles and environments around the world, including on tour with the RAF Search and Rescue, uh, with the, in which he's conducted numerous rescues on the hills of Scotland and the Falkland Islands. Uh, medicine has always been a keen interest of Ollie's, especially trauma care, uh, now based down in the south coast of England, where it can be often spotted dangling under the red and white hel helicopter over the Solent. Um, outside of his day job, Ollie's keen motorcyclist um, and adventurer and has previously covered motorcycle expeditions as a team medic. You also love to teach and you've been part of the WEM faculty since 2017, I believe. Yes, yeah, that's right. Excellent, excellent. Cool. So, guys, in this session, we're going to cover a number of uh, a number of different topics. So, what we're going to cover really is just some of the experience and, and or qualifications you might need to get into pre-hospital care if you're not a paramedic. Um, so, maybe if you're a doctor and or nurse. Um, some of the personal qualities that are important for pre-hospital work. Um, some of the resources available to upskill uh, and some of the maybe more empirical empirical qualifications you can take. Um, we're going to look at how the pandemic's changed pre-hospital care because I think that's really important. Um, and then we're, we're going to also examine some of the fundamentals of pre-hospital care around um, performing under pressure, how you get the best out of yourself and or team under pressure. Uh, we're going to look at um, some of the, a common aspects that, that both Claire and Ollie work in, which is working on helicopters and how you do this safely and some of the tips and tricks for navigating uh, working on, uh, on airframes. And then we're going to just look at some of um, Claire and Ollie's experience and just dig into that, some of their, their most challenging moments and most successful moments as well. So my first question, um, Claire, if, that, if it's OK, uh, if you go first, just so how did you find yourself in your current role? So I'm right in thinking you're a critical care paramedic with Thames Valley Air Ambulance. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. So um, I joined Thames Valley Air Ambulance in August 2018. Um, they went independent from the ambulance service and took on 11 new critical care paramedics. We were very fortunate um, to be selected um, as one of the new training CCBs. Um, but my background was very much I went back to university at 30 um, and did my two year course, the old sort of two year course in South Central Ambulance Service um, and uh, Oxford Brooks University. And uh, then spent a few years in the military and then left the military to um, start my new job with TBA. Uh, so I fell into the SAR world by accident, really. So as you said, I was a load master in the military. I did around about 13 years, and that's a non medical role. Um, but while I was at RF Benson, uh, I a job came up for search and rescue. So I thought, well, I'll give it a go. I didn't really have an interest in medicine before then, although my dad's a paramedic, so maybe, you know, by osmosis I did. But anyway, so I applied and was successful. I ended up up in Scotland at RF Lossy Mouth. Uh, I did a couple of years up there. Then it, SAR was privatised, search and rescue SAR. Uh, I stayed in the military for a bit longer, then decided, actually, I really enjoyed search and rescue. So uh, I found a job came up with my current employer and I applied and was successful. So I'm doing it now and I plan to do it for a long time. Just looking and, and, and doing a bit more of a, a deep dive into the educational aspect of your role. So Claire, you mentioned before, you believe sort of fundamental attribute of critical care for you is about digging into some of the empirical research and melding that with the ex experiential anecdotal experience. What, um, so how, how did you 
get into the MSc? And did you did you think that was did you, did you think that was kind of a a bridging step to where you are now? Did it did it help you in your current role? Uh, so interestingly, um, I did my foundation degree at Oxford Brooks, and then I um, decided to do the uh, online top up. So in my first few years as a as a newly qualified paramedic, um, I did the online top up and got my BSc in paramedic practice. Um, I then um, in 2018 undertook the diploma in immediate medical care at the Royal College of Surgeons, um, and the actual the MSc is part of our job role at Thames Valley Air Ambulance. So um, it's very much part of the package that's offered to us as a critical care paramedic. So um, we are fully funded to do that um, and interestingly a probably interesting point is we do it in advanced clinical practice and the reason that Thames Valley chose that was to keep us very broad so that we can work in a range of environments and it's sort of the advanced practice and the diagnostics that we're really interested in um, and we do that at Southampton University um, and we, we go there um, one day a week um, for the modules and we are all fully supported and um, we study leave to do that so it's, it's part of the package as a trainee CCP that you, you have to undertake the MSc. Yeah. So it's an expectation almost that you that you take that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. And to you, Ali? Uh, so it might surprise you to know, I think you know this, Owen, but I'm a non-degree paramedic. So uh, a lot of my training was done through a company in North Wales called Outreach Medicine, uh, and it's all modular learning. And it's it's based around this environment. So the course is called Hazard and Hazardous Environment Medicine. And it's all based around, you know, the search and rescue environment and the sort of rescues and, and bits will be involved in. So all my paramedic stuff was done through that route. I do have aspirations to go on and take this to degree, masters, all the rest of it. But actually, for my role, that's not required. Okay, and that was that was through Orms. Am I correct? Yes. Yeah. That, that hemp is that the hemp course? The hemp course, yeah. So I, I started as a hemp T on the end technician, and then I took that on to hemp uh, and did more training through them. Yeah. And just an interesting point, actually. I think um, as of next year, I think you have to be a degree awarding body to to then go on and, and and become a paramedic. So I think this is the last year people can actually probably access that that route into becoming a registered uh, pre hospital clinician and or paramedic. Um, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah, quite interesting. Good. Okay. So my next question really is that you both. So you both work on helicopters and or cars. Um, Ollie, I know it's a fundamental part of your of your role. And um, what are some of the what, what are some of the attributes you've learned through working on helicopters for a long time? Just around around safety and or uh, safety and or situation awareness. Yeah, so obviously helicopters are quite dangerous in general. I'm sure you'll both nod at that. Um, and a lot of my role, uh, the helicopters in the hover the whole time. So actually, a, a big bit of the safety is just operating the aircraft so forget medicine for the time being we have to make sure the aircraft's safe so you know if we're tight up against a boat or up against a cliff we need to make sure the aircraft's in a safe configuration and a big thing for us as well especially with a helicopter on now is downdraft so you know, the air coming out of the rotors if someone's in a bit of a precarious place you don't want to cause them injury by blowing them off you know blowing them off the cliff or wherever they might be uh, and then from from a medical bit some of the attributes you have to Bear in mind from, for the sort of role I do is fuel is a big thing for us. So because the aircraft's flying most of the time, even if I'm not on it, it's burning fuel the whole time. So I need to always keep that in the back of my mind and have that as a, a thing that I use to plan my, my care package, if you like, for whoever I'm dealing with. Absolutely. And Claire? Yeah, so very similar actually. So at Thames Valley, we um, are a, a helicopter te technical crew member, which means that we sit up at the front um, with the pilot in the left hand seat. So we are very much, when we get the job, focus very much like Ollie is not really on the medicine bit. You know particularly what you're going to do, but first and foremost, you've got to get the pilot to the uh, to the landing site. So we very much. Um, are involved with the navigation and certainly the safety side is not so much as we leave RAF Benson but actually when we land in areas where uh, people look up see the helicopter and want to come over there's certainly been many times when we're looking around and people are walking very close to the rotors of the helicopter um, so, and then once you're out it is the medical care and then back into the helicopter if you're transporting a patient by air um, you're doing a dual role there you are the, the critical care paramedic alongside either a doctor or another critical care paramedic uh, depending on the configuration of that day but you're also doing half of the technical crew member job because you're still going to make it safe to take off um, so yeah it's multi multi jobs at the same time and then likewise with the fuel if we are bouncing from job to job you need to work out whether you're going to be able to get there and more importantly you're going to get to the hospital or whether the pilot will have to go back and refuel in and come back and get you so just from a from a technical point of view um, claire is, is is working in a finite space and i'll come to ollie after this sort of with some of the some of the more technical interventions such as 
RSI, such as maybe giving blood or other things? Do you, do you try and do some of these interventions before you're in a finite tight space and, and, and then sort of plan ahead um, and do things with, with more sort of 360 access? Yeah, so I think we we tend to do a lot of the stuff on the ground. If we are going to take a patient by air, they generally have to be quite stable because there is so little space in our aircraft. We're 135, so straight away we don't have 360 access um, in our helicopter. Um, and we very much um, brief when we get in the helicopter, we've got a checklist on the side of the aircraft to make sure we've got everything in flight, um, to make sure potentially we've done the pre-alert um, and we've got the kit that we might need because our bags then get put behind my seat in the left hand side so once you're strapped in with the patient you can't really access any of your usual kit we have an emergency airway bag um, but yeah you need to think about what you're going to do next so you're multitasking as the paramedic sorting out the logistics and, and working out the what if what if what if um, and if a patient is that unstable we tend to go by ground so we have got the ability to stop um, and, and do any interventions that we need to do um, on the ground rather than in the air. Fantastic. Oh, Ollie, from your perspective? Oh, yeah, I mean, I could, I'll could echo what Claire says, but sometimes where our role differs is if it's a winged rescue, we might not have the luxury of stabilising the patient in situ. We might have to just get them straight to the aircraft for their safety and ours. Uh, but we are, we do have the luxury of being in a 189 helicopter. There's a bit more space. I know I had the Isle of Wight air ambulance on the other day, and they were loving how much room we had in the back. Um, but what we read across to any helicopter you're on is the fact that they're noisy. So any interventions you're going to do that require you to, you know, use use your ears and be able to hear what's going on, even chest decompressions, like things you might consider simple. When you're on a helicopter, it can be difficult because you can't hear, you can't hear the beeps and squeaks of all your equipment. So if you can get it done before you get on the aircraft, as Claire will agree, I'm sure, then you will do. Uh, and then it's just a skill you, that you learn once on the aircraft, how to properly, properly monitor just with your eyes and not with your ears. And uh, using, using these, I uh, wave around a lot, but uh, yeah. Absolutely. And more importantly, the patient can't really hear as well. So you have to make sure that you're briefing the patient before they get on and what to expect and what's going to happen. Because once you're in the air, you've got to rely on your non-verbal communication. So, you know, the thumbs up or or looking at patients and trying to work out what they're thinking and trying to help them or, or you know, maybe writing something down. But but certainly it's, it's a different environment when you are flying to the hospital. You've, you've got a lack of them. Um, yeah. So let's touch on that a little bit more, guys, actually, because I think it's it's absolutely pertinent and relevant, both working in very noisy environments and very um, frenetic and and just that incremental noise. How have you both learned to navigate effective communication in, in noisy environments? Ollie, to you first. Just training, train, train, train. Um, so we do a lot of uh, on the ground training, obviously, just for the technical skills. Um, we do a lot of uh, airborne training as well, just to practice, like I said, that just getting used to looking at the screen as opposed to listening to the screen and looking at the patient here as opposed to listening to what's going on. Uh, so just practice, 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 and hopefully it becomes more muscle memory and it makes it easier on a real job. But it's a skill that definitely fades, so you definitely have to keep practicing, keep practicing, and we have rolling currencies for things like that. And to you, Claire? So I completely agree, actually. Um, we we do a lot of simulation at TVA, which I, I find is fundamentally vital for the role, especially with the different configurations you might be on with a different doctor or different CCP. So it's really key. Um, we pre-brief in the morning of who's going to do which roles. Uh, our roles are very interchangeable. Um, so we know what we're going to do. And actually, an example of a sim that's probably quite pertinent is um, one of our senior paramedics actually did it with me and one of the doctors one day. And we got given a pair of headphones and it was playing music, any music, the radio, um, and we did a sim, we did a, an RSI, so you know, rapid sequence induction simulation, um, and we couldn't speak to each other. Um, and it was really fascinating how we um, relied on non-verbal communication, on looking at things, on maybe writing things down and speaking to each other, using the checklist in a very different way. Um, but it was really fascinating, and I'm sure we'll come on to it um, in a bit, but it certainly helped during COVID because that's been a, another um, sort of um, hurdle we've had to come across um, in full PPE and, and doing some you know, pretty tough jobs and not being able to really hear. Yeah. Yeah, very good simulation, taking away your hearing and trying to work it out. Yeah. So, so just looking at COVID and the current environment, which is a, which is an increasingly difficult environment, both in and pre-hospital. Ollie, from your perspective, how have you navigated, or how how has the team you work with uh, and the system navigated the current climate? So it's it's definitely changed things. Um, as as Claire touched on, there's a lot of you know a lot of verbal communication via headsets and things uh, when you're flying, and even just putting a mask on 
changes that dynamic massively. So you can't really hear each other in the aircraft. Sometimes it makes things a lot more difficult. But um, as far as the, the actual role goes, because you know we, I winch, having to try and we had to figure out how how am I going to winch with PPE? We had all the directive from the company, which all was perfect. You know, all, all lay out everything you should do. But until you've done it and tried it practically, I remember my first winch job was to a, a COVID cruise vessel uh, that was anchored off the Isle of Wight, and and they you know they they were a COVID patient and I had to put them in a stretcher winch them they were going to be close to me I was going to have my kit on is that going to be affected by the aircraft is it going to blow blow my mask off and things we had to navigate and tackle and sort of learn along the way it all worked out fine you'll be glad to know but uh, yeah it's it, it's changed that dynamic and then like Claire says just basic things like just when you land at a job and you just want to talk to another clinician who you don't know you know someone from a road ambulance it takes away so much of your communication by the fact you're all dressed up in masks you can't see people's faces you can't read their lips when it's a bit noisy. It makes it a lot more difficult. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I, I, again, I completely agree with what Ollie um, is saying. I, I found it particularly different um, and difficult in PPE. So most of the, the jobs that we're going to, we have to go into level three PPE. So by level three, it's the full Tyrex suit, um, a mask, two pairs of gloves. Um, and it is really tricky and a, and a visor. And, and I feel that um, my role is slowing down. So when you turn up at scene, you're, you're trying to get that handover from the crew or the team leader that's there. And you, you feel like you lose a bit of a momentum because you've got to then get to level three. Um, so we've worked out very quickly that, you know, get on scene, take your phone and your radio off you. Because often the first time I went into PPE, I left my radio on me and then the, the suits on top of it. And then I can't actually then speak to anybody. Um, but sort of to try and do concurrent activities. So maybe um, get into level three PPE as you're getting the debrief um, we certainly learned quite quickly that if there was three of us on a crew um, that one person would stay out of PPE and go into level two only so level two being the the mask um, and gloves and an apron um, almost to run that scene and more importantly be the um, the continuity between the family because um, I find you know breaking bad news in level three PPE is just really unacceptable understanding completely why with covid um but yeah we'd certainly learn some lessons if we can do that we will do that and and just generally being quite hot and being in there for a long time and and sometimes feeling quite sick in the aircraft um sorry not in the aircraft we're not flying patients at the moment but in the ambulance it, yeah it's been it's been tricky for everyone and and patients just don't see your face i think you can you can give a lot away to your patient but just your non-verbal communication and, and a simple smile and that all gets taken away and, and patients can't see you and i think yeah it's, it's really tricky it's been it's been quite tough yeah and it's quite scary for patients as well when when you come dressed like that although it's a precaution most of the time it definitely adds to their their nerves when you're going to take them into a hospital and everyone's fully donned up in their suits so you have to a lot more reassurance for your patient that's what i'm finding anyway just yeah. trying to you know, keep them calm it's going to be fine but it's just a precaution i need to put this mask on you just as a precaution yeah absolutely and and to seb's point on the chat you know it does muffle your communication muffles your muffles your your speaking and or your speech which makes it really almost impossible sometimes to get to get to get um information across so there's a quick question from sapna um she's an st2 trainee and wants to build uh, on some of the fem um, so the pre-hospital emergency medicine. So she's asking what courses and or building blocks to look into really um, and, and, and or if there's any short-term fellowships available to get some experience. Um, so any pointers from you guys? I, some, some things are springing to mind in my mind, but, but Claire and or Rolly, anything that you've got? Um, I can only really speak from Thames Valley Air Ambulance. We don't really offer fellowships, and unfortunately. We do offer observerships, um, so um, people can come out on our um, critical care car. So that's a good stepping stone. Um, I know some air ambulances have open clinical governance days, and I think they're very good to go to and sort of start meeting people and looking at sort of the types of, of pre-hospital jobs um, that you might be um, involved in. Um, and certainly other ambulances offer observerships and fellowships, but yeah, unfortunately at TVA, we don't so much. Absolutely. So, so just from my perspective, I, I'm cognizant that uh, Bangor um, ED offer a fellowship, I think, in uh, with, um, I think it's um, a couple of, um, I, I'm not entirely sure what the, what the breakdown is, but there's the, there is a, a number of, of hours per week allocated, I think, from a specialist trainee point of view to either extreme medicine and or expedition medicine. So Bangor um, definitely have got a robust and long-standing history of offering an expedition fellowship along with an ED appointment. Um, and Exeter also do a fellowship um, 
with um, a yearly fellowship which incorporates the MSc in extreme medicine. So they give allocated time to study the, the, the MSc in extreme medicine. Um, and so, so those definitely are two institutions that I'm aware of from a, from a, doc, from a, from, from a specialist trainee perspective. Um, that you could get involved in SAPNA. So look at look at the uh, Banger um, uh, Fellowship and also the Exeter uh, ED Fellowship in Extreme Medicine. So um, that's it. Okay, excellent. Jamie just says post uh, ACCS Fellowship offers twenty percent FEM at Banger. Thanks for that. Absolutely. So it's an eighty twenty split, which is which is which is excellent actually. So twenty percent of the time is pre hospital emergency medicine and eighty percent of the time. Uh, I'm assuming would be uh, would be emergency medicine, um, which is which is excellent. Perfect. Good. Hopefully that answers that question. Good. So let's pivot slightly. One of my favorite terms, pivot. Um, let's pivot slightly and just look, have a look at. So just dig into your guys experience, really, and and look at some of the most challenging um, case studies that just some of the, some of the most it, challenging situations you guys have found yourselves in within within the pre-hospital arena because it's I think anyone who's been in the pre-hospital environment for long enough certainly gets tested to to to, to their limits um, so Ollie from your perspective can you recollect any really challenging moments that you've had to endure uh, within sort of in, within pre-hospital medicine yeah so <laughs> most of my most challenging times have been um, actually on road ambulances, mainly involving children, I find, you know, paediatric jobs tend to be the ones that really push you and test you, mainly because your emotions get, get involved. But obviously I'm here to talk about SARS, so I'll, I'll tell you a, a SARS story. Um, so I suppose the, one of the, the biggest jobs I had, the one that tested me, not so much from my clinical skills, but just from my overall care, if, if, that, if that makes sense, was a, a job down in the Falklands for a, a poorly sailor. Um, so uh, he was... Um, he essentially got into hypervolemic arrest on a cruise ship, uh, on a, uh, a warship, sorry. I was the winch operator at this point, so I wasn't the guy that went down to the boat, but a lot of stuff happened once he came to us. So the winchman went down, um, the sea state was terrible. You know, our job, we have to winch and put people onto these vessels. So the weather was terrible, the sea state was terrible. He did a, an amazing job at stabilising the patient and got into the aircraft. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that when you're flying that you'll, you'll obviously remember from your days as well Owen is you're wearing a lot of kit so anything you're doing saps the energy so at, the, at this point we were in immersion suits uh, which are warm anyway um, and it was a cold day but you're still quite warm especially when you're doing uh, CPR for I think we were doing CPR for 20 minutes to hospital and then on the trolley into the hospital uh, and the hospital we took them to this deployment this military deployment was um, it was normally a quiet place so it's where they'd send uh, baby medics if I can use that term to you know, to bring their experience up. What they weren't expecting were two paramedics to come bundling through the door with a severely ill patient uh, who needed fluids. Uh, so where, where I found this job difficult was I was extremely fatigued. Uh, you know, we'd been doing all of the skills, all the access, all the ACLS, everything that you'd normally do for that sort of patient. Uh, but then we had to manage the hospital staff. Uh, not all of them, just, you know, a lot of the team. And when you're fatigued, any job you're doing, when you're fatigued, it's really hard to think straight. And not only do we have to manage what was happening then, they had to think forward and to write what does this patient need. So they needed they needed blood. And actually, on this job, uh, we then managed to step away from the patient, mobilise a load of individuals to come and give blood directly out of them into a bad quick test into the patient because that's what we could do in, in the deployment that we were on. But that's the one of my SAR jobs that stands out to me. Not so much, like I said, from my clinical skills, but just from having to juggle, having to spin so many plates and actually, you know, put them all in the right place to get this patient stable. And it turned out. Uh, semi-successful in the end you know, we managed to stabilize the patient uh, but yeah that's definitely when someone says to me right what's what's your hardest SAR job that's the one that pings straight to my straight to mind and hopefully someone's taken some learning points from that I know it's more of a story but a lot of what you know I find in pre-hospital is that, that planning ahead not just doing what you're doing plan ahead what's the next step what's the next person going to need to do with this patient how can I help that pay for that person Absolutely. And, and like you said, just not any future commands, but you're right, just trying to predict the trajectory. So, yeah. so, so looking at the trends, getting as much from the patient as possible from a monitoring perspective and, and see which, which, which way they're going. And you're right, take, staying almost two steps ahead of the team, but bringing the team with you. So sharing the mental model and starting to prepare for future events before they should arise. I completely understand where you're going. Oh, and I know that you teach your 10 for 10. So uh, I've had the pleasure of teaching alongside you many times. For those who don't know, 10 for 10, this is Owen's thing that I'm stealing right now. 
Uh, take 10 seconds to plan the next 10 minutes, and that is vital, especially in the pre-hospital world. Have a stop, maybe not completely stop, but have a, have a stop, have a think, right, what are we doing? Communicate to everyone, this is the plan, and then enact that plan. Yeah, so I think one that particularly stays with me um, was one last summer. So I'm about um, sort of nine months into the job, so still very junior, um, working with a FEM trainee, so um, someone who's come out to do two years of um, in hospital and pre-hospital. So they do two weeks in hospital and then two weeks um, with us. So I was with a FEM trainee and we had a camera crew with us because we were being filmed for um, emergency medical. Uh, helicopter medics at the time so that was just a little bit stressful I'd never really been filmed doing my job before um, and we got tasked to a 17 year old um, peri arrest um, from a stabbing um, in Milton Keynes so a long run for us to Milton Keynes uh, well, in the air about 20 minutes um, and get there so again updates um, from the paramedic on our desk so we have a paramedic in our critical control um, on our critical care desk sorry um, and getting lots of updates landing in a school not being able to get it to out of the school having to climb up a hill um across a fence just generally tired when you get there um and the 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 young the young lad is still in a car because they can't get him out and he looks sick he looks really sick he's, he's peri arrest and it was just all bedlam um and that time out that you just spoke about ollie is, is really key it's like well, what are we going to do and how are we going to do it um, and we eventually got into the truck and I just felt that I wasn't on top of my game to, to speak. So exactly what you say, what's happening and why is it happening and what are we doing next? And you're trying to preempt that. So we're trying to work out whether the guy needs blood, whether we should give it or not, whether we need to decompress his chest. We're trying to speak to our consultant on call to get a little bit of top cover because of some of the things we need to do. Um, and it's all going on. And there's no communication. Oh, I felt there was no communication. So the paramedic, he was with us in the back of the truck at this point. Brilliant, absolutely great. Um, but in hindsight and in the debrief, she said, I had no idea what was going on because we were very much talking to ourselves and, and getting confused almost slightly um, and therefore not involving the rest of the crew um, and not planning ahead. And so then we ended up having to phone the consultant back to get some more advice that we probably should have thought about of like, okay, if this goes wrong, what is plan A, B and C? And we didn't quite have that. Uh, luckily, the, the patient survived. It, he was critically ill and he, you know, we enacted the major hemorrhage um, protocol um, at the hospital we took him to. But yeah, very much felt that it was more stressful than it needed to be. And things that I've now learned from that is that timeout, right? Time out for everybody. This is what's going on. This is what needs to happen. And this is what each person needs to do. So when you give, when you give jobs, I'm really bad at this and I'm getting better at it. When you ask someone to do something, you have to, and there's a top tip, I guess, is you have to ask someone to do it. If you're in a situation, we'll take a cardiac arrest, for example, and you say, can someone give adrenaline with your adrenaline? No one will give adrenaline. Whereas if you ask someone in particular, okay, and hopefully you know their names when you get on scene, okay, Owen, could you give adrenaline? You're more likely to get it to happen. So I certainly learned that on that job because we're all talking and nothing was really happening. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's definitely was one of my challenging jobs. And we debriefed it. And it was really interesting in the debrief how we both felt and interestingly how the it came across to the camera cameraman. So he said that you look like you were in control, but you felt that you weren't. And yeah, so I, I learned a lot from that day, a lot. Oh, that's excellent. So just some of the points there, I completely agree with just about around ownership of commands and, and getting that closed loop communication. But you're right with the nonverbal eye contact and, and, and naming it as well. Um, and then, like you said, stopping the micro conversations and just having a macro conversation. So having one conversation whereby everyone's listening, everyone's aware of, of maybe the injury load the, the, uh, uh, and the consequential treatment and or diagnostics that you're just about to perform Every, everyone is is fully aware and and almost slowing down to speed up in that regard so what what you're doing is it just is bringing everyone onto the same page but that's that sounds um fantastic ollie just a question that's popped up into my mind is something we spoke about earlier actually and i think it'd be really helpful just to differentiate for people listening and are watching the difference between SAR and HEMS, search and rescue and helicopter emergency medical services. So in your mind, what, what, what's, what's the differentiation between those two? Yeah, so I mean, I'll answer according to me, but please, Claire, um, feel free to jump in. They're very similar roles, but they're also very different. And they often get put under the same umbrella, whereas actually I feel sometimes if the clinician on the ground knew exactly what helicopter they wanted, perhaps that patient would get better care quicker. So on the HEMS side, um, you know, uh, Claire alluded to the 
you always tend to fly with two critical care paramedics and one doctor or sport, something along those lines anyway, meaning that their ceiling of care is higher than on search and rescue. So, you know, they can do pre-hospital emergency anaesthetics or RSIs, whatever you want to call it. And their prolonged care is also better in the fact that they can give more drugs and they can do more to that patient. Um, on the flip side, you know, my role is, as it says on the side of the aircraft, search and rescue. So a lot of my role actually is to do with either searching or rescuing people and medicine is a bolt on. So on a UK search and rescue aircraft, the top level clinician you'll have will be a paramedic. Sometimes you'll have two paramedics, but often you'll have a paramedic and a technician. Uh, and yeah, our, our main concern most of the time is, not most of the time, a lot of the time is to rescue. Uh, but then obviously we do have the luxury of a larger aircraft so we can, we can tie in with other agencies. But yeah, the biggest difference for me is if someone needs to be rescued, if they're in a, a tricky place, you need a search and rescue aircraft that will also be able to give quite high level medical care. But if they're in an accessible place, a uh, place where you think they're going to need, you know, anaesthetic, then you're wanting a HEMS cab because they can deliver that skill that we can't deliver. But Claire, like, feel free to step on that if you, if you disagree at all. No, absolutely not. No, no, it's, it's great. I think we certainly have, um, again, when we're on the critical care desk, we sometimes get asked to use the helicopter to extract people from a difficult location. And, and we do have to decline that because actually it's like, do you need critical care intervention? Because um, that's what we really provide by moving the team to that incident. Um, and certainly like if it's a, an extrication problem, then we, we may suggest heart or other paramedics and moving people out. So yeah, we, we certainly use our HEMS platform, like you say, to take the critical care to the patient as opposed to the search and rescue of, of going in and rescuing patients because they're in an inaccessible area. So for anyone watching this and, and, and wants to get into either critical care and or SAR uh, rescue, so, I'll, I'll direct my question to, to Claire first. What, what steps should they take um, experientially? So I'm, 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 I suppose I'm fishing for a number of years in post and or clinical steps as a paramedic, doctor or nurse. What, do you, what would you advocate before dipping your toe into sort of critical care? Um, so certainly from the experience of um, TVA or in terms of earlier ambulance, we had to have three years post registration experience um, full time. So either in a, a frontline ambulance service, the military, so to speak, or um, to speak and or um, a private um, provider. Um, I guess um, that's probably very similar for, for nurses who want to come into pre-hospital care. Um, and certainly there are lots of opportunities in South Central Ambulance Service for nurses to work in pre-hospital care. I'm very much about skill set. It doesn't really matter what your background is when you come to critical care. Um, and I think, and it's only my personal opinion from a, a, a doctor side, it's very much um, you choose to do either the National FEM training programme, uh, ST4 or 5 I believe it is, um, or we have a fellowship which is a two year fellowship, so you do uh, over the, the FEM training year over two years, um, two, two weeks in emergency medicine and, and two weeks at FEM. Um, so we sort of do have quite senior doctors come and join us. Um, but I think the experience is key. Um, I don't think that you have to have done 15 years on an ambulance. You know, traditionally, that's what people used to say. I think if you are really progressing and you're really keen to develop and you take all the opportunities that are afforded to you as a newly qualified paramedic and you try and navigate the role that you want to go into. So if it's critical care, start early, go and do observer shifts, talk to critical care paramedics, go to conferences and speak to people about the job um, to make sure it's A, it's for you and B, to mould maybe your, your top up degree to critical care modules um, or, or some of your training and your CPD um, to what, where you want to be. Fantastic. So, um, so Ollie, just a question from Mike Fallon. Um, are there any opportunities for doctors in search and rescue outside of mountain rescue in, in your experience? So on the aircraft, like I said, we, the, the top level clinicians, paramedics, we don't fly with doctors. I know we have doctors in sort of um, administrative and uh, you know, prescribing roles in, in the company, but as far as flying on the aircraft, then, then it's no, I'm afraid. But I mean, I mean, Mike Fallon's, Talk there about mountain rescue and, and there's also things like coast guard rescue like um lifeboats i know that they take doctors on those sort of platforms and it's the same world it's the same you know rescue orientated slash medicine world so that that would be the way i'd explore it as a doctor hopefully that answers this question it does, I'm afraid, no. it, does. <laughs> it does so claire to you uh, sapna's asked another question on facebook live and she just asked what challenges do you face managing difficult airways in unfamiliar environments what, how and how maybe you'd approach it? 
Um, so we have um, quite a lot of equipment, as, as, as do um, Ray paramedics. Um, we certainly um, do advanced training in airway management um, and we have to either sim or do two airways a month to stay current um, as a, both a CCP and pre-hospital doctor. Um, I find we use the video laryngoscope, I find that quite useful. Um, I find that if you're, you're using that, it's got a little, for those that don't know, it has a little screen on the top. So whoever's doing the intubation, um, the other person can watch this, certainly from a CCP point of view, if I'm working with a consultant, they can, they can have a look and, and see what I'm seeing. Um, and, and and sometimes just airways are really difficult and sometimes you just can't manage them and I've certainly been into a few cardiac arrests where you just cannot get past A because of either sort of a lot of blood or a lot of vomit um, and you just, just do your best. We also are trained to do surgical airways so I've, I've never done one but certainly there are some people in our organisation that have recently done surgical airways. Absolutely. So just as an adjunct to that I absolutely agree I think uh, I think it really is about role play uh, just to make sure in in training you've you've sort of trained as as, as much as you can for, for for reality so when you're when you're there you you, you are ready for, for some pretty challenging cases um, sequentially we normally go, go through the airway ladder ourselves so we would start with basic adjuncts um, and like Claire was saying before share the mental model make sure everyone's aware get lay out the kit before you commit as well um, basic things often work well um, if you're struggling with with a suction unit pop this yanker sucker off so you've just got the suction tubing which has got a bigger hole myatus to, to suction the airway um, and sequentially move up that ladder um, as claire was saying so some of the more primitive things if they don't work such as op airways or mp airways start to look at maybe more advanced techniques but again share the mental model slow it down make sure you're prepared um, uh, and you're, you're you've 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 got plenty you've had a plenary group chat everyone's on on side because the more complicated the intervention the more time and the more hands it might it may require certainly rsi is is is, is the case there but also from my experience um certainly preparing the airway kit getting good 360 access to the to, to the to the head ramping the patient up so you've got you've got good view a good view of the cause or you're optimizing your view of the cause doing 30 second drills so putting the laryngoscope into the right side of the mouth uh, moving the tongue over to the left side of the mouth draw, withdrawing under direct vision um, starting to do burp back up right um, uh, pressure so just starting to optimize a, uh, optimize the view uh, you can look at the Celix technique which is cricoid pressure that's not to improve the view but that's just to stop passive regurgitation um, all these suctioning under direct, direct vision all these 30 second drills to really optimize the, the, the first attempt at, at that airway sharing that with the team making sure the team is aware that you're going through the 30 second drills if the, if the first if your plan a doesn't work have a plan b have a plan c um and then and then and then go through go through it sequentially but almost slowing down and bringing everyone on on board with with that plan uh, and don't be afraid to move to the decision point quite quite quickly in a plan in a consensus opinion because actually sometimes in the airway ladder i think from my own experience um from critical care with for 15 years is sometimes you actually need to you need to go in at a certain level and and not sequentially move up the airway ladder if if the situation mandates it so it really is uh learning where to come in uh, but but not not be getting or or belying some of the fundamentals around good a good jaw thrust, um, a, a well fitted OP airway, good, good nasal nasal airways which are suctioned well with soft suction catheters, um, and and then it buys you some time to really to, to appreciate your ceiling of care. So Ollie, to that point, and your ceiling of care in the search and rescue environment, especially if you haven't got chance to stabilise the patient on the ground because you're directly winching them from. From acutely from the scene into the into the, into the into the airframe, um, what is your ceiling of care with airway management? Uh, so up to intubation, uh, well, in fact up to surgical airway, uh, but, but predominantly up to intubation. Again, likely I've never done a surgical airway. I have intubated on the aircraft, but yeah, and is that not as you said though? If if even when you're looking at the aircraft, if the patient's in a position where you think I'm not going to be able to treat them there, but based on a mechanism of injury, you know, taking out, taking on your surroundings, this has happened, that's happened. They're likely going to need some airway management and you're going to prep your kit beforehand. So although you're down, get the patient in some sort of distraction, 
straight into the aircraft. We then put them in a position where we've got our kit laid out, so we're good to go straight away. And because you know we practice, 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 people know that there's only two of us in the back, and you tend to know your role. So uh, it's just that prior preparation to make sure that you can give the best care you can as quickly as you can. So I, I completely agree with that, and I think simulation is key, and and simulation of difficult airways. Anyone can sim. Anyone can put a tube down. It, but it's the simulation in those difficult circumstances or when things go wrong um, and knowing your kit I think that's key I know where everything is in the airway bag it's the same setup in every car in every um, in the aircraft um, and, and you you can put your hand on stuff you know where things are um, and the, I think your key point about position is very key I have often moved patients even if their airway is awful you, I have moved patients first or got them onto a scoop and onto a trolley um, to set yourself up for success the first the first part has got to be the, you know hopefully the most successful one so set yourself up to to get the airway first time if you can and if you can't um, do your 30 second drills and but always talk i think it's really important even when you're just looking in with the laryngoscope tell people what you're seeing and um, because it shares your mental model and it lets others offer their opinion when it's needed so claire Ranjit's just asking around debrief and what level of debriefing support you get in your respective roles and uh, and as a consequence of that what what level of debriefing do you in instigate i suppose as well because you probably be an instigator of debriefing as as well as have supported debrief from other people from your perspective how does that look in tvaa so debriefing is absolutely key and i think is a fundamental part of each job um, certainly from a critical care team we debrief every job and then we debrief sometimes in clinical governance it goes further um, I like to debrief with the crew I absolutely think that's fundamentally important so you know potentially if we've uh, we've called uh, a death on scene we will try and do a hot debrief with South Central Ambulance Service um, there and then um, or we'll often try to move back to an ambulance station if we can do it there um, and we very much rely on the South Central Ambulance Service team leaders to run that debrief and we, we sequentially go from the first person on scene what we did um, and quite often it's, it's sort of debriefing what, what we've done and why because sometimes if we're working out different protocols it's, it's really key for the clinicians on scene to know. Um, in terms of, I guess, psychological debrief on a slight slant, um, we're very well supported at TVA and we can access quite a lot of mental health support if we feel that we are struggling with a job. Um, we, we use TRIM, so trauma risk management um, came from the military and we have um, TRIM practitioners who will look after us. But I think it's key to debrief. I don't think you can put the job um, to bed, so to speak, without actually going back to the start and talking through the job properly and what went wrong and what went right and what you would do differently next time. Ollie, from your perspective? Yeah, very similar. So, you know, I, I was brought up in the military, so I'm very used to briefs and debriefs. Um, and in the aviation world, they're a big thing anyway. So, you know, for our jobs, we'll tend to, near enough exactly what Claire said, so I'll just summarise, we'll tend to debrief as a crew, as in maybe from the aviation perspective, obviously with the pilots involved, we'll then step away as the, as the tech crew in the back and have a medical debrief. And then if other agencies have been involved, we'll, you know, if, if required, get hold of them by some means, usually through the rescue centre, to then talk through, like, was that good, was that bad, could we do anything better, and then tell them if we think that we've got any points for them. I've been doing a lot of work recently with the Hampshire Isle of White guys, and, you know, it's great. I'll always get one of their phone numbers on the job, and then you can text out, say, right, what happened there, da, 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 and you can chat through things, which is which is great. I'm my own worst critic, so it's always good to speak to other people and, and get a bit of feedback, and that's how we get better, isn't it? Yeah. The scene is difficult. You've got some incremental pressure and noise, uh, the, the patient's difficult, you've got a difficult airway, there's been a, a large mechanism, say fall from height, wouldn't be uncommon for you, Ollie, and or you, Claire. Um, and the team aren't necessarily performing, they're not, ne they're not really listening to you, there's a lot of frenetic noise, that you can start to feel the stress creeping into your bones, and you can start to feel the job slipping away from you. Um, so you know what I'm going for here. So I'm notion towards this sort of high performing team kind of aspects and how you how you how you how you carve and or create that high performing team with individuals you haven't necessarily trained with, paramedics, technicians or, or otherwise, that you've just met fresh that day. Claire, in your mind, how do you get the best out of people when you feel like the the incident's slipping away from you? 
Yeah, uh, so I think you start the minute that you walk onto that scene. I think you can, I'm very keen to find the team leader um, or the bronze commander, whatever, you know, whatever they're called on that day um, and ask what's going on. And I will walk a scene. If there's multiple patients, I will walk the scene with whoever I'm with. That's a critical care team. Or often we work on our own as well. So we do shifts on our own and I'll walk the scene. And then we'll say we'll get to a patient and I always introduce myself and I ask people to introduce themselves as well. Um, and then I'm a massive fan of timeout. So a bit like your 10 for 10. I'm just like, right, okay, cool. Can we just have a bit of a timeout here? Everyone stop and let's just go all the way back and it, you know, back to sort of catastrophic hemorrhage and go through that sequentially. I then often like to, for my own personal um, benefit, is offload jobs that I can do, um, but to the people that can also do them. So I try to use everyone in the skill set that, um, that they're in. And sometimes that's difficult because I forget and I just sort of give out um, some jobs and then they, they can't do it. But, you know, to offload some of those jobs to allow me to do the jobs that I, I can do. So blood, for example, um, I'm sure everyone can set up a blood, but on, on our particular ambulance, we know how I, to use our kit. Um, so I try to do that, the closed loop communication. So come back and tell me when we've done that. And then there is nothing to stop me, again, having another time out. So like, where are we now? Good, right? Is that cannula in? Yes, thank you. Brilliant. Have we got TXA in? Yes. And I think to try and just keep that control. Um, I often, as well, if we're a bigger team, is one of us will just not get involved and act as that team leader um, and stand at the foot of the patient or to the side. Um, and I write things down. I write a lot down. Um, and you can just come out of that scene if you've got the capacity to do so um, and then you can you can manage that scene a lot better um, but yeah I think time out is key um, making sure everyone understands and if you're asking someone to do something they, they, they don't know I say it is fine to tell me you don't know that that's okay if you don't know for example a, K, a KTD a Kendrick uh, splint on the leg if, if I ask people to do it and say if you don't know how to do it please let me know um, as opposed to sometimes I've been caught or not caught out but I've asked someone to do it and they've been embarrassed to say they don't know how and 10 minutes later we still don't have it on it's very much having that that open forum to say it's, it's fine that you don't know how to put it on or, I, I can do that no problem or, or I will teach you and therefore we, we've done it together. I think in, in all pre-hospital medicine sometimes you walk onto a scene and it's utter carnage and you, you have to just find that initial that initial starting point like how am I going to start normally at A, when we're following ABC, but how am I going to start and I'm going to carry on? And communication for me is huge. So um, communication, I mean, you know, listening as well. So getting onto the scene, listening, seeing, actually not just looking, but seeing what's going on, absorbing it all so you can make your plan. What, um, you know, what tends to happen with us sometimes, which isn't always of, of benefit to me, is when I arrive dangling out of my little helicopter and arrive on scene in my bright orange suit, people assume that I'm going to have all the answers straight away. Oh, the helicopter guy's here, he'll tell me what to do. Whereas I haven't got a clue what's going on at that point because our pre-alert, as always happen, happens in pre-hospital medicine, our pre-alert might not be as accurate as it should be. So you turn up to scene and I've got to figure out myself what's going on. And, and then you tend to, because they're going to end up in, in the aircraft, you tend to drift into the leadership role, into taking charge of the scene and, and managing how you do that because at some point I have to take charge because I need to get this patient into my equipment to get them into my helicopter, but not doing that too aggressively, not doing that too slowly, finding the right balance. And it's all about communication. Uh, and like Claire says, directing your communication properly as well. And then monitoring what's going on. So if you've asked for something to happen and it's not happening, you need to grip it and make it happen. Not in an aggressive tone, but you, know, you need to make sure the right things are happening at the right time. I think that's excellent. So grip self, grip team, grip environment, grip patients in that sequential fashion, which I think is, is that step acronym, which, which, which is absolutely something I would advocate as well. So Ollie, the next question to you would be, um, you, you, you get on scene to multiple RTC that, and uh, there's multiple patients on scene and loads of stresses. You can feel your heart beating in your mouth. Your, your <laughs> bit is narrowing and filling with all these stresses. Your, your peripheral vision is narrowing, your, uh, you lose, you're losing your hearing and also your sense of time and your ability to sort of think laterally. So, so I'm sort of notioning towards the components of a high, high performing individual be, belying the high performing team. How do you get control of your own physiology in, in these extremely si stressful situations to then confer that to the team? Well, if I'm honest, it sounds like I shouldn't be on shift if I'm like that. <laughs> um, again, it's, it's just taking that step back and you have to do it. And I know we keep repeating it, but it is the, the easiest way to take control of anything. It's just to take a pause and to absorb what's going on. And what's, what's really good is to know your own weaknesses. So if you, if you can recognise that's happening, 
don't assume you have to keep pretending you're at this level if you're not. Let somebody know. Delegate the jobs off to the people that are doing them correctly. I did a job the other day where, um, you know, we, we cover a 24-hour shift. And I was in a deep sleep when the bell went off and I was on scene very quickly. And I hadn't, if I'm honest, I hadn't woken up. Uh, and although, you know, I like to think I know what I'm doing in my role, when I've only just woken up, it was taking me, oh, I could tell it was taking me a long time to spool up for that. I need to do this. Why is my brain not working? So I just delegated a lot of it to the clinicians that are on scene. And I was just saying, can you do that? Can you do that? And, you know, I was making decisions that would benefit the patient to end up in the right place. But just recognising myself, I was fatigued and passing that on to somebody else for the time being until I had spooled up enough that I felt like I could grip what was going on. Because at the end of the day, it's all about patient care, isn't it? No, no one's up to be, you know, I don't have to do the skills as long as somebody's doing them. But just that recognize, recognizing in yourself when you're not at your best. So a question really to Claire um, that I think all three of us and anyone who practices critical care and or search and rescues probably had to come to terms with. How, Claire, how do you deal with failure? Uh, because there is certainly a lot of failure, both either personal and or corporate failure, if the trajectory was already written. How, how do you process that? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I am my worst enemy. I'm my worst critic. And um, I probably overanalyze everything I do. I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, in my first three weeks, um, a job, I was working with a, a doctor um, and we have doctor and paramedic doctors bags. And I, um, we came back and it was a double paramedic crew taken over from us and a job came down and it had uh, a fear all over it. This patient was really sick, head injury. So the doctor decided to go back out with the paramedic and I was like, no problem, I'll sort all the kit out. And um, I failed to give him the doctor's dog's bag. I just forgot. It was a very new. Um, so they got to scene and didn't have um, the rock uranium, which is in the doctor's dog's bag. Um, and I felt awful. I, but I think it's also about that, A, the duty of candle for the patient, I think. Um, but also secondly, realizing that it's okay to make mistakes. Um, it's not okay to repeat those mistakes, but it's okay. Um, I, I phoned up the duty manager straight away, said what I'd done. Um, and then just the reflection um, of, of it, of how it made me feel, and it made me feel awful. Um, but then also um, the open and honest reporting that we have at TVA, you know, it is okay to make mistakes and it is, you are supported in making them um, and learning from them. Um, but I think, yeah, and also once I think you've learned from it, you, you've got to move on. Um, I've definitely in the past ruminated on mistakes that I've made and I don't think that's healthy. So I think you, you, you can make a mistake, you have to learn from it, not make it again, but then move on. Otherwise you will just get stuck in a circle of, of, um, of over questioning everything. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I am my own worst critic, and I, I also beat myself up if I've done if I feel like I've done something not to the best of my ability. But I tend to find if I come back, discuss it with peers, and see what they would have done in the same situation. You know, sometimes you'll get well, I would have done that as well based on what was happening, and you think, oh, okay, well, so I wasn't just you know not performing properly. But then going in and doing a bit of CPD is always helpful, isn't it? So if you've done a job where you've you've not quite performed as you should, go into research that topic, do a bit of CPD on it, and then you come out as a better medic. Uh, and then hopefully next time, and I've definitely had this where I've not performed great, done some CPD, the same jobs come up, I've performed a lot better because of what I've learned. So it's the best way to do it. So just looking at some of the best parts of the role, really, I know we've looked at some of the grimmest and or most difficult parts <laughs> of the role. Uh, as true, true to sort of human form, you always want to know what's worse rather than what's good. But looking at the good bits, so, so Claire, from your perspective, have you got any pinnacle moments where you just sort of sat back maybe in the helicopter and or car and thought, wow, that was actually, I really, you know, I'm, I'm so glad I'm here right now and I'm doing this well. Yeah, I, I think there are lots of moments. I think, I think the job is great. I think, I, I think some of the good things that we can bring is that um, decision making and complex decision making. And it, it, this is a sad story, but I, I think it does, it sort of ruminates with me about what I enjoy about the role. So we were called to a, um, a young lady in cardiac arrest. She was only 34 and four young children ranging from age three to 12. Um, and she'd been ill for a long time, uh, crew on scene and a PA arrest. So unfortunately um, she was still in PA when we got there. And we worked with this crew and we, we almost got taken along a little bit by it and we, we moved the, the, the young lady into the ambulance. And then we sort of had that time out, that moment of time out. It was a 40 minute um, trip to the hospital and, and what she was suffering from, it, you know, it was always, it wasn't necessarily palliative, but it was a sort of life limiting condition. And, and we sort of thought about what, what was best for the patient and, and we decided to call it, which is really sad, but actually the best bit of that job 
was rather than potentially giving false hope to a young family is that the doctor I was with and I spent a long time on scene with that family um, and we discussed it with each of the children in turn in for age appropriate for them so very different telling a, a three-year-old or maybe he didn't quite understand but the six-year-old um, and, and then sort of the teenager and I came away from that job and thought actually Sometimes it's not the clinical aspects of the job that's important, it's the non-clinical bits and the, the, the technical and the non-technical stuff you can do. And I, and I just remember sitting with that family and we, we got stood down, it was great. Um, we had as much time as we want, but sometimes some of the um, ambulance crews don't because they have to clear and go on to the next job. Um, and I, I came home that night and thought it was absolutely horrendous that that young lady died, but we provided her family with a service that may potentially only we could have done. And we um, got them in um, contact with our patient liaison manager, who was then able to help them after with their bereavement and, and sort them out, especially the, uh, the teenager with some sort of bespoke adolescent um, grieving process. Um, and so that for me was a very good job um, of, the, of the skills that we bring just to that complex decision making and being able to help families and patients at the same time oh yeah so what Claire said really resonates with me as, as a, you know giving closure to families sometimes is great but I'm going to talk more about the, the SAR role um, so one of the best bits of, that I find of the job that I do is the variation so as an example the last one of shifts I did and this was a couple of weeks back um, I started off um, there was a Burns patient supporting the Isle of Wight Air Ambulance so doing some stuff with them and then later in the shift I was then on a, on a coal ship, uh, treating two patients. And I was right in the depths of this coal ship. One had a back injury, one had nearly cut his finger off in some machinery, so I was dealing with that. And then later in that shift, we then get called out to a pure rescue, which was somebody essentially clinging onto a cliff by their fingernail, uh, where you know we winched out to go and rescue them, pluck them off and get them to safety. And I just love that variation. I mean, it's not always that busy. That was a, that was a busy shift, very you know, good timing for this chat. But, uh, you know, we don't always do that sort of stuff all the time. But when you get a shift like that, where you've done so much variation, you've helped a lot of people. It's a great feeling when you come back and think, well, I actually did my job then. You know, we searched for people, we rescued people, we did a bit of medicine, helped somebody out. Yeah, it's very fulfilling when you get something like that. So Tanith just, is just asking on Facebook Live, um, is there anything hospitals can do to, to streamline your handover and, and or transfer to A&E? So have you seen any systems that have been done by different trusts particularly well um, in, so in sort of handover and or transfer? Claire, from your perspective. Yeah, so um, the trauma centre that I tend to feed into um, have, have a very good system. So we will phone um, and then um, they will direct the questions. So interestingly, they'll use it, the Atmos formats, but they ask the questions, which is, is was a little bit of getting used to, but it works well. Um, and then certainly I'm a very big advocate of um, a handover, a quiet handover. Um, so the first question we get asked when we go into resource is, are there any immediate concerns? And if the answer is no, we do a very gentle handover, uh, sorry, a very gentle move the patient off our trolley onto the bed. And then I tend to ask the question, is everyone ready for handover? And if people are still talking, I don't start my handover until everyone isn't talking. Um, and I think that works well. And the staff in our major trauma centre are very good. And then at the end, are there any questions and there's opportunity of questions. Another way I've certainly seen it in the military and sometimes again in the major trauma centre is that the person who gives the handover goes in first. So there's no patient. And they give the atmist, um, and it means that people can't fiddle almost. You know, you're not getting someone taking the monitor off and looking at the airway. Um, and it's only when you finish your handover and I've asked the opportunity for questions does the patient get brought in? And I think they both work very well. But I, I, certainly, uh, the experience I have in our major trauma centres is, is very good. Um, some of our trauma units um, are not so used to critically ill patients sometimes and, and um, get a little bit distracted. Um, and again, I think that's just a bit about being able to grip that and say could you just wait until we finish the handover the patient is perfectly safe and and people do listen um and yeah it works well so two different ways and i think they both work well so Olive, have you seen any initiatives uh, by any local hospitals and or teams or indeed your own team um so the the quiet handover is key so the trauma centers i work for is exactly the same you know and i suppose if it's if i'm saying to a, a non-helicopter crew, how could they help us? Just allow us to arrive and get our kit off is the main thing. I've, I've had people try and get handovers when I've still got my helmet on and I can hear all the comms and I can't actually hear what's going on. But a quiet handover is great. But what uh, my trauma centre does a lot, especially if we're on a, a busy day, is we'll hand over on the helipad. 
which you know in the right circumstance can be really helpful because a lot of the time what I'm thinking about is fuel of the aircraft you know we don't want to run out of fuel on, on the helipad so uh, a succinct handover to the right people close to the aircraft so we can get out of your way as quickly as we can uh, to leave you to deal with a patient and we're not burning fuel for the sake of it that's always great in our world and that's normally teed up through the rescue center uh, but yeah I mean Claire Claire sort of answered all the questions there straight away which made it easy sorry <laughs> so, sorry <laughs> So just looking um, now at sort of health and well-being and some of the mental health initiatives that have popped up within both of your respective systems. Um, Ollie, from your perspective on the search and rescue, is there any, you know, we've seen a massive um, cover, media coverage around mental health recently and, and quite rightly so. Um, are there any initiatives that within your within your um, domain and or system that, that are in place to to ameliorate or offset some of the mental health? Yeah, so there's a, there's a system, um, the name escapes me, but it's very similar to the, the sort of trim system that um, Claire spoke to, and there's a further range as well. I did a, a job um, the other day, I won't go into the details, but it was you know, quite an emotional, stressful job. And the company were very good that that day I got a phone call and straight away I was tapped into a channel where um, you know, I was getting emails, phone calls, uh, different like the trim system i think they do like three days 20 days so there was a network we could dial into and it is i mean i didn't use it i didn't feel like i needed it in that in that case but you know who knows what the future will bring but it's very important to use that system if, if you feel it's required but what i find really helpful is just to speak to my peers so just to sit down with a crew with a tea and essentially have a chat and uh you know there's always a bit of banter it helps to ease stress doesn't it so just have a chat talk through the job and then if you feel like you need to go further then you know you take those avenues that are there for you and Claire, from a TVA perspective. Yeah, I completely agree with Ollie. I think peer-to-peer -peer support is great. Debriefing the job is, is often is, is all the required. Um, we're very well supported, so we have a senior manager. And in fact, we've only got three, which is really interesting. So that's in a, 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 um, a small small team. And they keep an eye on HEMS base when they're on duty. And if there's a particular difficult job, A, they might see it. But if you're the critical care uh, paramedic on the desk, we often phone the senior manager, we call them the SMOC, um, and phone the SMOC and say, just to let you know, the crew have been out to a, a three-month-old paediatric cardiac request for example, and then they can offer the support. Um, we also have our patient liaison manager who looks at every job as well, and he'll often um, phone say, are you okay, or text, are you okay? Um, we have a chaplain um, that we can access if we want. Um, our HR are very good. Um, Trim and the employee assistance program. So there's lots of avenues for people if they want them. Um, and there's certainly just, sometimes just a little chat, uh, a call like Ollie says to, to someone to say, look, we saw it was a really tricky job, are you okay? Um, is often enough. And, and when it isn't enough, that's also okay. And then they will like sort of sign post you where you need to go. So Claire, from your perspective, is there anything you've had to unlearn as, as you progress through the sort of hierarchy of clinical care to being a, a critical care paramedic? Is there anything you've had to unlearn as a paramedic to, uh, through progression that, that that serves you now that maybe didn't serve you before um. yeah I think there's there's quite a lot I think um, we've, we've touched on it quite a lot about the debriefing as a, as a junior paramedic if I can use that term but as, a, as a road paramedic you're very much being led in that debrief um, and it was a sort of a step change for me having to potentially lead that debrief um, I've learned that my practice or, I, you know, again, as a very paramedic, um, not often did you get feedback of the jobs, um, whereas I, my practice gets questioned a lot. Um, so I've had to learn that, yes, you are going to have your practice questions. Um, you are going to get referrals. You are going to have to um, sort of um, speak about your actions. Um, but yes, yeah, certainly it was a bit of a step change to go from being a paramedic to a CCP um, and learning a new system. Um, but also trying not to forget that you are still a paramedic and there, you know, there are lots of uh, things that we can do well um, when we go back and do road shifts. So, yeah, I think debriefing was the key one that I learned how to, to switch roles. So I think for me, I had to and learn not to just blindly follow the JR Cup and actually think for myself. So as a, as a baby paramedic, I remember the day I changed from tech to paramedic and I was very nervous because suddenly I was the guy giving all the drugs. Uh, and, uh, and it's very easy at that point then to get out your JR Cup. So, you know, in the UK we use JR Cup and go, it says, do this, do this, do this, do this. And that's all you do. Whereas in my role, the JR Cup, and this isn't me saying ignore it. That's not what, that's not the message I'm putting across, but it doesn't always fit into my scenario because I might like I said I might be at the bottom of a cliff or, or wherever I might be on a boat somewhere so having the confidence to think for myself 
and maybe circumnavigate what it's telling me to do, maybe get to this step quicker than this step. Uh, an example of that might be a fall or a C-spine injury where the book's saying, M over lies in big capital letters, whereas actually I can't quite do that just yet, but I can do this, this and this. Uh, so just, and it comes with experience, I know, but just gaining that confidence to you know, know your subject and sort of navigate around some of the, what you initially see as a, a very strict, you must do this. But that, like I said, that will come with time when people have been practicing for a while. So just looking at some of the lessons learned, I know we've, 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 we've visited sort of highs and lows of the, of the role uh, and some of the most challenging moments and best moments, but maybe just from a non-technical perspective, is there any sort of key lessons that you've learned that maybe we haven't covered or that you just want to emphasize actually from a non-technical leadership, followership, situation awareness um, from a bandwidth perspective and or otherwise um, that you, that's really been hammered home through critical care, uh, Claire? Yeah, I think one the key for me is, and we've touched on it earlier, it, it is A, the communication, but B, it's the shared mental model. Um, so I often will go on scene, get a hand, a hand over and do something, and I'm always asking, what else should we be doing? What am I missing? Tell me if I'm missing something. And it opens up to everyone because people on scene see different things that you've missed. So example, right, what am I missing? Well, we haven't, the pelvic bind is not tight because everyone thinks that someone else has done that. So, so yeah, I think one of the key things is it is a team sport. Everyone, just because, and Ollie touched on it before, just because you're the CCB doesn't mean that I know any more than any other paramedic. Uh, and, and often um, it's the ECA that will say, your oxygen's not on that you're pre-oxygenating with because you we, we make mistakes we all do um so i think yeah that is a, is a key one for me that it, it, it's a team sport and everyone has an equal part to play and everyone should be empowered to speak up if they think that something is wrong or you're doing something that you shouldn't be and ollie from your perspective so, so if i was to rank all the non-technical skills right at the top i'd put situational awareness because everything every decision you make after that if, if your situational awareness isn't there, you're going to be making the wrong decision. So you've got to take that time to stop and absorb what's going on. But like I said, actually see what's going on, actually listen to what's going on and then make a decision. So if in your essay, situational awareness bubble, you've realised that this guy is really good at what he's doing in, in, in that bit, then you know, you're going to delegate your skills to that person and then that skill, that treatment will be the best that that patient can get at that point. But yeah, for me, situational awareness, just stopping and taking a moment to have a look. I know we keep we're probably repeating this over and over, but it is right at the top of my list. Absolutely, absolutely. So something that I, interestingly, um, when debriefing others and looking at my own practice, I'm constantly asking as well, am I reaching my ceiling of care? Is there, is there anything I'm doing that someone else could be doing so that I can maybe do something else? And it's certainly uh, from a few calls we've, we've recently responded to or my colleagues responded to, um, my, my question to them was, could someone else be maybe communicating with red base or with the with EOC if you are skilled to 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 take care of the airway and or maybe even sight an advanced airway can someone else be doing your role whilst you reach the ceiling of care and is everyone in the team then working cohesively to the ceiling of their care um, because chest compressions are great but actually it is it, it, it's quite and it's a fundamental role but it doesn't necessarily take much much i say much skill it takes it takes practice and it, you need to make sure it's formulaic but is is there something else that pay, that person can be doing to, to the ceiling of their care but absolutely everything you guys said about situation awareness about shared mental model and, and about stepping back and and really appreciating um something that you both said actually about active listening and and some, claire you mentioned it early on and ollie you've mentioned it as well and the first thing to do is put your hands behind your back and listen, listen to the scene, listen to the handover, really start to get an appreciation for the mechanism of injury. Listen to some of, some of the actors in the scene, when I say actors, the, stim, the, stim, the, the information stimulus which is coming, and chronologically and sequentially start to piece together the injury pattern you're seeing in the patient from, from what the scene is telling you. But again, that comes from active listening. As as a, as a forbearance for for that situation awareness and then and then come in, but almost putting your hands behind your back stops you from committing physically or or technically to the scene. And 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 you're right, it slows slows you down to then to then approach the scene. Perfect. So we're going to come into land um, on on those points. Um, is there and so just just looking really at um, one final aspect of 
So we've mentioned in, continual, in continuous improvement, and I think you know something, Claire, you were saying around continuous improvement, around what can, what else can we be doing on scene? What else does this patient need? What else does this team need? What else might I need? This is this zero point survey. Am I well fed? Am I well rested? From your perspective, um, how much does deliberate practice and or case review, sort of dissecting the case in when in a, in a in a in a sort of plenary environment, how much does that play into to into your role? Um, so I, I think it's vital. I think uh, deliberate practice is what we should be aiming to do um, and to do it well. Um, I take a lot of um, points and guidance from clinical governance. So we have a monthly clinical guidance and we normally have a theme um, and we will have jobs debriefed um, and other jobs because, you know, there are days and there are weeks where you are quiet, um, but you can absolutely learn. And, and you'll only learn by dissecting it. So we can all say, oh yeah, that job was okay. Look at the timings. Yeah, they got they got what they needed. Uh, but did they? Did they get it quick enough? Are we? How much? How long were we on that scene for? Um, or you know, time to blood. Okay, well it took you ten minutes. Could you have done that quicker? Um, and yes, you probably answer is yes or or no. It doesn't matter. But by by dissecting it and looking at your own practice, I think is key. Um, I think getting the 360 feedback from the hospital is always really useful. So maybe if you use ultrasound, did did that correlate with actually what was seen? Um, and it's a very it's a luxury we have on the air ambulance that a lot of our consultants work in our major trauma centre. So we do get feedback. But I think the feedback and deliberate practice. And questioning your practice is good. You won't, you'll never progress if you don't question your own practice. Yeah, you, you've got to question your own practice, but you've got to be receptive to feedback as well. You know, we will know individuals, so you can give them feedback that won't listen. That you're not going to better yourself like that. And um, in addition to everything Claire said, even take it down to the basic level. So, have I used that bit of kit recently? No. Do I know how to use that bit of kit? I'm going to get it out of the bag, and I'm going to use that bit of kit. So, you know, things like we might not get all the time, like KTDs and bits and bobs. That's what I'll do on my shift. When I'm on my 24 hour shift, I think, what kit haven't I touched recently? That bit, right, let's play with that and make sure I know exactly how to use it because you don't want to be figuring that out while somebody's critically ill on the floor in front of you. I think that's absolutely key. Um, and those, th those, are, those, are, those are absolute fundamental. So I've got a colleague in EMRS in Scotland. And uh, just to, to your feedback point, actually, guys, you, um, they go into the mortuary and with permission from the family and or pathologist, they look at their interventions from patients which have died. Um, and just to make sure not only were their interventions in the right place, what fundamentally killed the patient and so they're looking for feedback from the patient themselves uh, from surgical feedback and uh, whether interventions appropriate and or in the right place and i think you're, you're right ollie getting feedback from multiple channels and being receptive to that feedback um, and to claire's point around around really dissecting the case and seeing and and it, it's, it's measure and improve, isn't it? It's measure and improve, right? If it took us 10 minutes to time, 10 minutes, 31 seconds to, to time to blood when we knew this patient was bleeding, when, where and when can we minimize that? And let's measure that and improve, measure that, improve. Hopefully next time it'd be eight minutes or seven minutes or, um, but, but you, you won't know unless you measure it, uh, which I think is a real powerful barometer and, and then sharing that within the team. I think that's fantastic. Good. I think we're going to come into land there, guys. We've been going for one hour, 20 minutes. Um, and I think we've covered quite a lot of ground, actually, which is, which is great. So my thanks to the panel, to Claire and Ollie for their perspectives. You're very welcome. Yes, it's been excellent. Thanks. No worries at all. And thanks to all you guys for, for, for watching and contributing. So what I'd just like to do is just uh, is just mention a few of the other um, fantastic sessions that we're just going to be running uh, in, in the next few days. So we're going to be looking at the next session. So the 13th session is going to be with Will Duffin, the education lead, and he's going to be interviewing Glenn Singleman. Glenn is a physician, mountaineer, wingsuit pilot, and documentary filmmaker. So he's going to be joining us to discuss his career with Will, um, both as a medic and an extreme sportsman. He's going to be looking at how, he, how you can turn your hands to new skills or develop mastery, a uh, systematic approach to managing uh, risk in both clinical and adventurous settings, um, how to access that elusive flow state and, uh, in, a, in adventurous activities, and also how to optimize um, the neurobiology and genetics of risk-taking behavior. So how to mitigate physiology and, 
uh, and perform the best under under stress. So that that session is going to be um, going to be next week on the 24th of June. So please do uh, dial in for that session with uh, with Will Duffin, and that's going to be on the on the WEM Facebook and also all the WEM social media pages. So do uh, do look out for that session next Wednesday. Next Friday, the 26th, I'll be with Gareth Locke looking at human factors. Um, we're going to be dissecting um, some of the activity, uh, so how you actively manage fatigue uh, preemptively, some of the overarching lessons Gareth has learned from the military, from diving, and from some of his human factors training uh, in the medical domain, and how we transcend those domains and, and the human factors. Uh, looking at clarity of purpose versus clarity of message and task execution, and we're going to get Gareth's thoughts about how to break those down and look at what the scene truly needs from you at this moment and how to mitigate some of those human factors. And then just how we safeguard against some of our own biases. I know I struggle against some, some really real fundamental biases. So how do we acknowledge them and then mitigate some of those biases? So that's going to be June the 26th at 6 p.m. with Gareth Locke. Next session is going to be 24th of June with with Will Duffin. So please do tune in for those sessions next Wednesday and Friday. We'd love feedback from you for this session. So please do leave feedback on our socials. So on our Facebook page, on our Instagram page, and we will see you next time for the next Webcast Live event. Thanks, guys.